everyone has a story to tell about how managing their weight has affected them, how their weight changes up and down over time and the significance of how it influences our lives and the way we think about ourselves. Speaking for me, I've struggled to keep my weight down throughout my entire life. And looking back, it's been quite a journey. I'm 62 now. I don't mind admitting my age because it's okay. It's the best time of my life and I'm happy being me. But it really makes me pause to look that far back and consider that ever since I can remember, I've had to be watchful of my weight. I yo-yoed all over the place. I was a fat little girl. I, that gave me low self-esteem and I became an emotional eater, which made it worse. And it impacted everything I did, my grades, who my friends were. I was afraid to try out for anything because I had no confidence and I didn't want people to notice me. And then the summer before I went to high school, a miracle happened and I dropped down to a size 10. I found that a surge of hormones and the attention from boys were pretty good motivators. And then I gained and lost with each of three pregnancies. And I had a dramatic weight loss, an unhealthy weight loss going through a divorce. And later on, I gained back the excess weight from stress, went up and down with diets and diet pills, tried everything. And every phase affected my self-image, my relationships. Uh, I presented myself to the world, and I often held myself back from opportunities because I just didn't feel good enough. Healthy weight management is challenging because if overeating is your problem, you can't just quit eating like you would a bad habit. You have to eat every day, so your only answer is to develop a new healthy relationship with food, and it's even harder for compulsive eaters and people with eating disorders. First, I'd like to introduce each of our guests. Margie is a member of Overeaters Anonymous, who has kindly agreed to share her personal story with us. In lieu of an introduction, we'll just let Margie speak for herself. Hello, Margie, and thank you for agreeing to be part of our show today. Um, our other guest uh, is Naomi Lipple. Naomi has worked for Overeaters Anonymous World Service Office since 1994. She began as a writer-editor, and then she managed the publishing division for many years, and finally was promoted to managing director in 2004. With 18 years of experience working with OA, Naomi brings to us a great deal of knowledge and her own unique perspective to the show. Hello, Naomi, and welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. And finally, let's introduce Dr. Marty Lerner. Dr. Lerner is the founder and executive director of Milestones in Recovery Eating Disorders Program located in Cooper City, Florida. Dr. Lerner is a licensed and board certified clinical psychologist who has specialized in the treatment of eating disorders since 1980. Dr. Lerner also appeared on many national television and radio programs, including NPR, 2020, Discovery Health, ABC's Nightline, and he's the author of several publications related to eating disorders in professional literature, national magazines, and newspapers, including USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, and New York Times. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Lerner with us today. Margie, will you please share your story with us? Give us some background prior to your joining OA. Sure. Um, well, my name is Margie, and I'm a compulsive overeater which is how I introduce myself in Overeaters Anonymous meetings. Um, I really identify with the story that Lynn was talking about. I wasn't necessarily heavy as a child, but about the time I stopped growing taller, I grew out because I didn't stop eating. And um, I remember just having all kinds of things with eating. I got heavy and people just, I, I've always felt like I was big and out of it and not very popular in high school. And I just felt awful about myself and um, my weight went up and down some. Um, I was in Weight Watchers and um, Oh, I wasn't, I was going to try and remember not to say the name, but anyway, I was in one of the commercial <laughs> weight programs <laughs> and uh, they have an excellent program, but as a compulsive overeater, um, I lost weight, but then I just gained it all back again almost immediately afterwards. And um, I remember... Um, 
just going, you know, up, up, up. And I didn't know what had happened. Um, you know, it was like I started getting back sugar and I couldn't stop eating. My weight just went up almost as fast as it had come off. It was just amazing. Wow. And then um, one time I wrote down in a notebook, eat, eat, eat. That's all I seem to do. And that was um, sometime in my 20s, and I went to a counselor uh, and told her about that, but I didn't find a way until a little bit later. In, in my late 20s, I came into Overeaters Anonymous, and um, I heard about it from some friends of mine, and it immediately felt like the right solution for me because I tried diets before and although I could lose weight I couldn't stay on the diet forever and for me OA gives me something that I can do forever just uh, one day at a time and I don't necessarily diet now I am maintaining a, a healthy weight um, for more than five years, and I've been abstinent for over 10 years, and I feel really good about those things, and for me that means not compulsively overeating. I'm the kind of person who didn't just eat a little here and there and here and there, but went on heavy sugar binges with boxes of cookies and whole half gallons of ice cream and would then sit down in front of the TV and just space out. And that stuff just is completely out of my life now. And I am much healthier and happier in dealing with life uh, on life's terms, whatever, you know, whatever life tends to throw at me. One of the things for me is that I always tried to do it myself, all by myself. And part of OA is having friends and um, relying on God. Um, when my relationship with God is in good order, then making those little teeny decisions that I have to make every day about whether to eat this or that are just no problem at all and it almost feels like magic i know it isn't magic mm -hmm. but it almost feels that way because all by myself i don't have the ability to stay with that naomi uh could you start us off with a little background about o oa when it was organized what brought it about and what brought you to it Sure. Um, OA began in 1960 by um, a, a woman named Roseanne who was struggling with her weight for many years. And um, she actually went to a Gamblers Anonymous meeting in support of a friend. And so she heard them say the steps that are also based on Alcoholics Anonymous 12 Steps. And she realized that maybe they could help her with her eating issues. And so from that point on, um, she, you know, adapted the steps to compulsive eating and food. Um, adapted exactly from Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and she found that when she was able to apply this to her eating issues, she was able to lose weight and she lost a significant amount of weight and was able to keep it off. And she uh, started these groups. She had a couple of people who started a group with her and then um, it just grew from there. They were on a talk show and, um, and people started to hear about it across the country and Dear Abby got into it and, you know, made a reference in one of her columns and it just it just exploded from there but there is a distinction uh, between eating to live and living to eat um, if you know as Margie said you know she eat 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 that's all she ever does that's what she wrote down um, there's there's a difference between eating in a way to maintain your health and maintain your life and then eating compulsively. And so in Overeaters Anonymous, we address the issues um, that are driving people to eat in a compulsive way, to, to binge, um, to, to eat to eat addictively in the same way that someone might drink addictively. Um, you know, often people um, talk about, in a way, talk about 
eating in secret or eating normally in front of people and then going home and having these huge binges or kind of grazing all day or just obsessing about food constantly from one meal to the next. That can be very similar to someone who has a drinking problem. Um, so what they need to learn to do is put food in its proper place for them. Um, and that can be different for different people. And so that's, you know, that's one of the things that people work on in the program. Well, thank you. Um, Dr. Lerner, um, I know uh, uh, it's going on what Naomi just told us about the problems people have in, in that go to OA. How, how do you know if you have an eating disorder? The people out there listening, how do they know if they should head for OA if they do need help? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. <clears throat> Let me preface some of my comments by making a few statements. First, I would say that <clears throat> there's a, excuse me, one has to delineate between what's a weight disorder, what's an eating disorder, or what's a weight disorder and what's an addictive relationship with food. It's much like, if I can borrow from the analogy mentioned about alcohol um, uh, dependency, there's a difference between a heavy social drinker and an alcoholic. <clears throat> and probably the poorest way to measure an addictive relationship with alcohol or an addictive relationship for, with food is, is defining it in terms of, for the food addiction, what somebody weighs. A better definition of, of you know, an addictive relationship with food is the extent to which that relationship becomes debilitating to one's quality of life. And for the social drinker versus the alcoholic, there is a loss of control, and there is also uh, the degree to which uh, there are consequences associated with um, using or abusing alcohol. Uh, to put it another way, if uh, a social drinker goes to the physician, the physician says, look, you have some, some irritation with your liver enzymes are elevated, you need to stop drinking or to cut down over the next 30 days, the social drinker will be able to do that. The alcoholic won't. For someone with a food addiction or compulsive overeating problem, they're not going to have the ability, um, although they may have tried time and time again, to consistently uh, uh, control their relationship with, with food or with weight, if you want to look at it from that perspective. So, uh, if I can, the, the American Psychiatric Association had gotten a group of, of uh, docs together to try to formulate a consensus on what defines something as a dependency and what defines something as a bad habit. And they came to a consensus, and I'll tell you what the seven uh, components of that consensus are, to delineate between a dependency uh, versus something that might be uh, a bad habit. And this would include process addictions like compulsive gambling or compulsive shopping, but also um, uh, addictions such as alcohol, drugs, and food. So the, the first uh, uh, criterion is tolerance, and that simply means that you have to do more of the same substance or more of the same behavior to get the same effect. So for the gambler, the bets start to increase. Um, uh, for the food addict, the amount of food and frequency of binging increases. For the alcoholic, the amount of alcohol increases to get the same effect. The second is withdrawal, which can mean either physical or psychological withdrawal. Most people with food addiction uh, uh, will go through some kind of physical withdrawal if they have, uh, for some people, a, a real dependency on high glycemic foods like sugar, uh, white flour, et cetera. Some won't. But most people will go through some sort of depression or feeling of deprivation or psychological withdrawal when they no longer self-medicate with either food or another substance. The, the third is is the using or the behavior last longer than they intended. So someone may intend to um, overeat or eat for a period of time and end up finding that they're, they're using or abusing the substance longer than they intended to. A big one uh, is, is unsuccessful effort to cut back or control. Anybody that has a compulsive overeating issue knows what it's like to try and control their um, binge episodes or overeating episodes or even bulimic episodes. The other is a significant time to either obtain the substance or to recover from the effects, which is pretty self-explanatory. 
Um, <clears throat> the sixth is decreased activities due to the dependency. Another way of putting that is isolation. As was alluded to, people will make up for lost time when they're by themselves, but they tend to cut back on their social activities um, in lieu of the addictive behavior. And then last but not least is to continue doing the same thing over and over again despite the consequences. So if you look at those seven, the astonishing thing is you only need three of those seven to meet the um, American Psychiatric Association's definition of an addiction. So I think that that's one way to screen or, or look at delineating between a weight disorder and, and an eating disorder or food addiction. Yeah, how, can you help us out a little bit? What, what about bulimia and anorexia? Tell us what well, the difference yeah, is. Well, I, 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 I think there's semantics involved in all of this, um, but let me... You know, years ago, there was a delineation uh, in AA and, and Narcotics Anonymous between people who abused and were dependent on alcohol versus uh, people who used or abused drugs. And, and today, it's rare to see someone in either of those 12-step fellowships that hasn't abused both. And I think what's happening in, in OA as a support group is that uh, there is an influx over the uh, uh, last decade, I would say, of more and more people who are not overweight, who may be indeed normal weight or even underweight, who have an addictive or compulsive relationship with overeating, but also engage in an undoing activity such as self-inducing vomiting, compulsive exercising, or what another form of bulimia might be, feast or famine, which is another way of saying overeating on several days and then fasting or undereating on other days. So there's so many variants of addictive relationships with food that it's not always an overeating or binge eating syndrome. Um, it can take the form of bulimia and some forms of anorexia where someone literally is overeating, but they're purging or exercising so much that they become cachectic or underweight. Uh, Naomi, um, mm -hmm. now that we've been... Now that you have this influx of people who are not necessarily overweight but have a serious problem uh, such as bulimia or anorexia, when the, those people come to OA, what, what kind of help do you have uh, for people that actually have real disorders? Um, well, we have special focus meetings um, specifically for people with bulimia um, and or anorexia, although anyone with a problem with compulsive eating is welcome in any of our meetings, um, regardless of how their particular um, addiction is showing up in their own lives. Um, we do have some literature for them, and people who are bulimic and anorexic who have recovered using Overeaters Anonymous have found that um, you know, the materials that we have and the AA materials as well um, work for them, you know, even if uh, it might say compulsive overeating in a particular pamphlet, someone who's anorexic is able to sort of make that leap and say, well, for me, it's compulsive undereating. Um, and, and many members have sort of bounced between all three. And so they, they may be binging at one time and then, and then binging and purging and then starving themselves. And so, so many, many members feel that, you know, the three compulsive overeating and bulimia and anorexia are kind of all manifestations of a similar obsession or a similar disease. And, um, and so we don't make a lot of distinction in Overeaters Anonymous between one or the other. If you have a problem with food and your relationship with food in a compulsive way, you are welcome in Overeaters Anonymous and we can help you. Naomi, bring, oh, Naomi brings up a very important point, I, I think, and, and that is that uh, OA is a very inclusive um, uh, support group. And two points I would make about that. One is OA doesn't purport to be treatment. Um, it purports to be a, a, a grassroots um, support group rooted in, in a rich tradition of what's worked for many, many, many people, uh, which is a 12-step program that originated um, with Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and I think that's an important uh, distinction to make. And, and that many people will... Uh, find in OA that that becomes a conduit to, to a front door of getting into treatment when more is needed in the, in the realm of treatment as opposed to just um, of support. And then as important, if not more important, maintain their recovery by using OA 
through the back door of treatment or rehab um, and, and long-term support or lifelong support, very much uh, akin to what happens with alcohol and drug uh, treatment. Some people uh, can recover using a support group, and some people require medical intervention, detox if it's alcohol and drugs, and rehab, and then re-enter into 12-step groups. And it's becoming more similar for some uh, or a contingent of people that um, uh, first enter into OA with more severe and coexisting or comorbid problems along with their eating disorder, such as depression or cross addiction with chemical dependencies, et cetera, et cetera, i.e. diet pills, um, 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 and we can go on a whole list of, of, of coexisting or complicating factors. Dr. Lerner, I uh... I'm a recovered or recovering alcoholic, also a recovering narcotics user. I, I used prescription drugs to kill pain and got addicted to them. I was an alcoholic for 20 years and I lost everything, absolutely everything. I lost my wife, I lost my children, I lost my home, I lost two cars out of three. I lost everything and I was left with nothing, absolutely nothing. Are there any similar situations like that in Overeaters Anonymous, do they lose everything or is this, what, we, what we call trying, that a bottom. <clears throat> the portrait you're painting is, is what's in vernacular called a bottom. Right. And, mm -hmm. and yes, people lose their lives. Um, they lose their spouses. They lose their dignity. They lose, um, they lose as much, if not more, perhaps not as dramatically as one might describe with alcohol and drugs, but nonetheless, it, it's as devastating. And I think, you know, the, 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 key, the, the key to this, again, is there is, as there's a difference between a social drinker and an alcoholic in stages of alcoholism, and there is a difference between someone who's overweight and occasionally abuses food and may go to a commercial weight loss, you know, program because cosmetically they want to look five pounds thinner, and someone who has a pathological and dependent relationship with food and body image or weight. And, and that level of debilitation has stages uh, of progression, early, middle, and late stage. And in late stage of that progression, the people that you will find uh, coming into OA later on in life have had devastating medical, emotional, and spiritual consequences to their addiction um, uh, with uh, with food and weight, and uh, you know, Excuse me. Go ahead. It, it, it's devastating. And the devastating part of these diseases, whether it is uh, um, bulimia, bulimorexia, anorexia, binge eating disorder, compulsive overeating, alcoholism, drug addiction, compulsive gambling, or what you ha what have you, the consequences of addiction are are, are more excruciating from the mental piece than from the physical piece. Most people in recovery, regardless of their addiction du jour, will tell you at their bottom, whatever that was, they would have preferred to have two broken legs than to have Absolutely. suffered the, the, the emotional devastation of their addiction. OA, as a support group, does not endorse any particular <clears throat> um, position on good or bad foods, good or bad food plans or diets or what have you. It, you know, my, my experience with OA referring patients there is that they, um, they've given some guidance um, in, in terms of uh, choices of food plans. My professional experience and my background in research suggests that there's a, a rather big contingent of folks with addictive uh, 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 relationships with food that have a high sensitivity to very high processed, very high glycemic foods like sugar, white flour, and or to a volume of food or the overeating piece of that. And for that contingent of people, they are more physically addicted uh, uh, to, the, to the food or those foods than uh, other people who might be more psychologically dependent on self-medicating with food. Just like there are alcoholics that are physically addicted to alcohol, yet there's a, a, a large contingent of alcoholics that are more psychologically addicted to alcohol and not yet physically addicted. And the research is showing us more and more that, um, that as you progress, 
to middle and end stage with food addiction, just like with drug and alcohol addiction, it does realter the chemistry and the anatomy of the brain in terms of neuroreceptors. It's fascinating research to watch. Hypnotism, medication, therapy, um, these are all very valuable adjunctive tools um, uh, to uh, help with recovery from an addiction, regardless of the addiction du jour. But the one thing that OA offers that, that the professional community cannot uh, offer um, is what Margie was talking about. It, it, it's the phenomenon of, of fellowship and mm-hmm. that, that there is a, a force, uh, call it spiritual or what you, what you like, where a group of people can do for, for an individual that that person can't do by themselves. And, and what OA has to offer in, in particular is, is not so much only the physical and emotional component to recovery, but the spiritual component to recovery. And anybody who is in, in, in recovery from a devastating addiction through a 12-step program will tell you that the end game in working all 12 steps, the end game in going to meetings, the end game in using all the tools is to develop you know, a, a, a healthy dependence on something other than the food and something other than themselves. People in, in 12-step fellowships who... who um, get a foothold in recovery, but then lapse and relapse, kind of like a revolving door, may come to the realization that they need more help than their support system can, you know, can realistically give them. So to answer your question, sometimes people are more emotionally or physically compromised and need to initially go into a a more formal treatment uh, arena before being able to benefit from a support group. And sometimes people go into a support group and they find that no matter how hard they're trying, they need more help uh, than the support group can provide. But the important thing to keep in perspective is that rehab, including milestones, is only, you know, the first step in getting someone in a position to be able to um, begin but, but will not maintain their recovery. There is no cure for an eating disorder or food addiction or any addiction in my personal and professional experience. There is remission, but remission is not accomplished on your own. For the most part, it's possible, but that would be exception to the rule. So there's a lifelong commitment to making OA, uh, in this case, a part of your life, not your whole life, but a part of your life so you can get a life. So the freedom from the tyranny of this addiction rests in the long-term participation um, in a 12-step fellowship like OA. And the irony is that when you're in a position to give back to that organization by helping other people, that is the best insurance you can have um, in maintaining long-term recovery. Thank you. All of the information you've given us has been very helpful. Marjorie, Naomi, Dr. Lerner, thank you for being with us.